This past week, um, we were a nation that grieved. We grieved upon hearing the sad news of the death of Stuart McLean. And I am relatively new to this country, but I was already a fan. Already a fan, already so comforted by the stories, the people, the really the soul that came from his storytelling. And it, of course, reminded me, um, as there were so many interviews replayed and stories, um, of that unique experience Stuart described in an interview on CBC back in 2012 of what it was to take a piece of music in vinyl, to take out from the cover, from this beautiful image, and place it on the record player, that tactile experience of placing the needle just where it went, and letting the room fill, fill with that quality of sound that really comes, that comes from analog experience of vinyl. And in my own life, I really wasn't ever listening to much vinyl. Um, it was really before my time in many ways. But, <laughs> but I did think of one story. It was one moment that came to me this past week. And that was uh, when, when I, I had a crush. And it was on a man, let's, let's call him James. And James lived in this teeny tiny apartment next to this fire station very cheap rent, and <laughs> very affordable. Uh, and and he, um, he had a beautiful record collection. And he would, um, he would, a kind of courtship involved me going to his teeny tiny apartment and sitting on the couch, and he would pick out, of course, a beautiful piece of music and put it on the record player, and we would just sit there and listen to the music. We wouldn't do anything else except absorb it. And it was, of course, James who inspired me to start my own record collection. I didn't have a record player. Um, so it was perhaps not the smartest move on my part to invest money in buying these records. But of course, I was, you know, courting James and hanging out in record stores and sharing music and talking about vinyl and playing vinyl music together was part of the glue, at least of that particular relationship. And so we wanted to share this Sunday morning with you that, that sense of glue that comes from the analog experience. Because we know we can tune into digital podcasts and music and stories from around the world. But there is something tactile, something embodied that happens when we come together like we do in church on Sunday morning. There's some fullness that we can only experience when we're here together. There's a story. Yes, there's a story. About writer, teacher, and transcendentalist philosopher Henry David Thoreau, which was my first inspiration for this Sunday service. Um, whether it's fact or fiction, I don't know. But either way, it lands the point. Thoreau is on his deathbed, and an old friend, knowing that he was very close to dying, asked if he had any sense of what was to come. Thoreau's famous reply, One world at a time. One world at a time. Thoreau died in 1862. He was 45 years old. 45 is a young age to die nowadays. Many of us live twice as long. One world at a time. How do we live this way? What does living have to teach us about death? And what happens when we die? Recently, I was a bit crass with a friend and said that it's kind of like a package deal at Walmart. 
a combo, buy one, get one free, death, life. You can't separate them. They're bound up in plastic wrap, and you get to the register, and you say, no, no, I just wanted this one. Oh, no. You ultimately don't get a choice. It will happen. In Thornton Wilder's classic play, Our Town, the central character, named Emily Webb, my name for most of my life, is written to reflect a very typical young person in the early 20th century. In the first act, Emily is a playful 12-year-old crushing on her neighbor. Maybe he had a good vinyl collection. In the second act, it's her wedding day, and she marries that same childhood sweetheart. The scenes from the first act are written to be very commonplace. We are transported to small-town life in a farming community. The milkman delivers goods. The family gathers around the breakfast table. It's quintessential, boring, even. In the third act, Emily has died in childbirth, and she's watching her own funeral, offered the opportunity to go back and live a day in her life over again. She leaps at the chance to return to her 12th birthday. And on this day, when she is back, she so desperately tries to get the people in her family to stop their routine and just recognize the beauty, the incredibleness of being alive. But she is very quickly frustrated and despairing. She finds the rhythms and habits of life and routine are so well defined that even with her pleas and insistence, her parents don't seem to wake up from their preoccupation with one thing while doing another, no matter how much she insists. Emily is distraught, and in this climactic moment, she cries out to the stage manager, a kind of meta character in the play, does anyone realize life while they live it? Every, every moment? Does anyone ever realize life while they live it? What a question. What a call to action, to awareness. Is it possible? How do we do it? I don't have all the answers to this. But one place, perhaps, to begin, and I'm not very good at this myself, but is to do one thing at a time. Social scientists who study productivity note the vast majority of people are much more efficient when they do one thing at a time versus multitasking. Our cerebral cortex actually can only pay attention to one thing at a time. And when people multitask, what we actually do is shift our attention rapidly between things. And each time we make a shift, even if it only takes milliseconds, the brain has to reconfigure again to a specific new task. This requires energy and effort, and it drains us. It has the effect of exhausting our systems often more quickly. When I um, had a job interview several years ago, and part of the job description was, you know, able to multitask or good multitasker, I was very excited to share this social scientist, science information uh, with my interviewer, and they were not impressed. I didn't get the job. Hopefully you'll be more impressed. One thing at a time. It's not easy and it's not my habit. But when I do it, I find 
that I am living more of the kind of life that feels alive, more of the kind of life I hope to live before I die. I don't know that anyone gets to the end of their life and says, I really wish I had multitasked more. (laughs) If I had just juggled a few more things. For Emily, in this play, death opens a door and allows her to recognize that even the mundane components were incredibly exquisite. It is often these moments people long for towards the end of their life. One more time brushing my teeth myself, going for a walk in the park with my kids. Maybe even one more moment pulling into a parking place and picking something up at the store. So often the experience of death for those who are living, is it is this opportunity to look around and say, am I living the life I want to be living? What is the purpose of my existence? What is the purpose of my death? I have a favorite t-shirt. It reads, love the hell out of the world. I was going to wear it today, but it was in the laundry. (laughs) Love the hell out of the world. It's a message coined by a group of Unitarian Universalist Christians who have been looking for catchy ways to describe our faith. Even before Thoreau dismissed worries about the afterlife in 1862, A hundred years before that, universalist preachers were circuit riding the eastern seaboard, proclaiming a new gospel. Based on readings that they had done of scripture and reflection, and in response to the dominant fire and brimstone pulpits, these universalist preachers boldly declared that all creation, all that is, is held in an everlasting love. That no person, no matter their conditions or behaviors, could, by a, a great, powerful love, be damned to eternal punishment. These universalists defined a new space in the theological universe, one that embodied a grander and deeper sense of love such that no one was outside the circle of salvation. It is perhaps one of the clearest, most defining, profound tenets of our tradition. Put simply, you are not going to hell. And no one else is either. Once I shared a similar message from the pulpit, and after the service, an older man came up to me. I had never seen him before. He was wearing a leather jacket, and he, his eyes were kind of watery. And he looked right at me, and he said, Thank you. I needed to hear that today. The part about not going to hell. Oh, I said, taken off guard. And after a pause, well, I meant it. I was humbled by his response because I often take it for granted that the people I serve and work alongside in ministry with are not too troubled about eternal damnation, are not so fearful. And yet, I don't know that we hear it enough. I think the fire and brimstone judgments are still quite loud, though may have taken different forms. 
And it is true as well that there may be a hell we're living in while we're alive. Living with cancer can be hell. Struggling and suffering with an addiction can be hell. Losing a beloved. And so while our faith may offer us this grand comfort regarding what won't happen when we die, it also demands that we live and face the reality of suffering while we are alive. And we are not offered a sort of reward to cling to that may comfort us in that suffering. Over the past several weeks, a group of people from this congregation have been meeting together in a class called Facing Death with Life. And when I sat with this circle, I was reminded how much we need one another. We need to hear these stories about things that are so often not directly spoken about. When I was with this group, I was reminded of words from one of my teachers, my inspirations in ministry, Reverend Marilyn Sewell, a minister at the Portland, Oregon congregation. In her final sermon to the congregation, I was there up in the balcony, and I remember this moment so clearly. In her last words to the church, she said, this culture we so often deny the reality of death. We use euphemisms like he passed away, and sometimes people don't even have memorial services or funerals. But no minister can escape the fact that people die. Old people die, young people die, middle-aged people die. And I want to say that I have seen a lot of people die, and they generally die very well. They die at peace. They are not afraid. This is a good thing to know. I think of the words of Walt Whitman, who nursed wounded and dying soldiers in the American Civil War. He wrote, to die is different from what anyone supposed and luckier. A few years ago, I was sitting with a small group of people from the church I was in at the time, and they were invited to share an experience they had of being a caregiver. And one woman spoke up. She said, I took care of my mother the last weeks of her life. And it was very difficult. My relationship with my mother was not close. She was very hard. And she paused, and her body language shifted it released. She said, and my mother, she was everything in her death that she was not in her life. She shrugged her shoulders and she said, I had no idea it would be like that. To die is different from what anyone supposed and luckier. What was the first thing that you remembered hearing about death or dying? What did people tell you as a child? So often there's an association with fear and darkness and uncertainty and some type of tension, contraction. And yet, over and over again, religious teachings offer us a different lens. The psalmist in Jewish scriptures writes, Yea, though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death, I will fear no evil. Contemporary poet Wendell Berry offers these words. To go in the dark with a light is to know the light. 
To know the dark, go dark. Go without sight and find that the dark too blooms and sings and is traveled by dark feet and dark wings. There are gifts in death. There are gifts we are here to live with. Maybe it isn't so scary. Maybe we need not be so afraid. The stage manager's response to Emily's plea, does anyone realize life while they live it every, every minute? He responds, saints and poets, maybe, they do some. I visited a Japanese garden with a woman who was a docent of the garden, and as we walked, she pointed out to me different things I maybe wouldn't have noticed if I was alone on my cell phone. (laughs) But she pointed out the golden koi, how they can live for a hundred years. The silhouette of the trees, how they were planted and pruned to give a particular shape in the shadows. The details in the texture of stone. We stopped and admired several stone lanterns scattered throughout the garden, and Joan pointed out that these lanterns were not actually designed to hold light. There was no place for a candle, no electricity for a light bulb. They're just decoration. I was surprised. Everything seemed so intentional in the garden. She said, the lanterns are there to draw your attention, to cause you to stop and look to notice what is around you. The lantern says, you are here. With darkness, with light. You are here. One world at a time. Amen. And blessed be.